Good. How are you guys doing this morning? <laughs> hey, if we have not met, my name is Denville. I have the privilege of serving as campus pastor here. Um, and in just a moment, um, I get the opportunity to walk us through um, something that is going to, to complete a series of talk that Pastor Scott has been doing for the past two weeks. And he's been talking about the mission of revival in our church. Um, and and I, I would love to, to, to maybe just kind of contextualize it here for us in Lake Zurich on this campus. Uh, if you don't know, we are one church with nine locations, and all nine campuses exist in a different place. And because they exist in a different place, they have different feel, they have different vibe, they have a different thing that they're doing. And the, the question that um, I'm, I want to answer for us today is, what does that look like here for this community, for this campus? Uh, we have a campus in McHenry, for instance, um, and they do a lot of great outreach uh, to, to folks who are without a home and for those who are in need. Um, up in Grays Lake, they have um, a community center where every week there are thousands of people who are, who are, who are being taken care of there. Um, we, have, we have campuses in different spaces, and they are an expression of the way that the people exist in that space. And I would love to maybe invite us into what does this look like in a community like Lake Zurich um, in the people who were called here. Um, and I just want to maybe begin having a conversation that hopefully we'll get to carry out in the next couple of weeks. I would love to frame our time together around a psalm that uh, hopefully most of you know. And I'd love for us to read this psalm together. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't know this by heart, um, make that your homework assignment over the next two weeks. Uh, would you memorize this psalm? It's Psalm 23. It's Psalm 23. It's going to be up on the, the screen here. And I'd love for us to read this psalm out loud together. Uh, it's in the New King James Version because I know that some of you are, um, are, are, are more ripe than others, um, more aged, more mature. Um, and so, like, it's my birthday. I'm, I'm getting there, right? So, uh, so, so this is the New King James Version. Would you guys read this out loud together with one big, strong voice? Let's read. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeah, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. If you don't have that memorized, um, if you don't have scripture memorized anywhere, if John 3.16 is the only one that you know, um, I would love for you to know this by heart. Um, uh, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the verses that people know by heart. Um, even if they can't quote it directly, the ones that they allude to, especially in arguments. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that the things that we know by heart reveals our heart. The things that we've committed to memory are the ones that are shaping us. And I would love for you to commit this to memory because it does have a shape that I think identifies this thing called revival that we talk about. If you've been around here for a while, you hear us talk about revival all the time. And maybe when, when you hear revival, you're thinking about like a tent meeting. Um, if, if, you, if you've ever seen those documentaries of like the Pentecostal revival, the Azusa Street revival. Um, and sometimes revival can feel like, like a moment where a lot of Christian um, charismatic things happen like a service, right? Uh, there's speaking in tongues and there's falling over and somebody stands up and says, this is revival, right? And that's you know it's revival. Um, or, or, or maybe when you think of revival, um, you think of just like an outstretch of miracles, like miracles and conversions all over the place, that that's what re re revival looks like. Um, or, or maybe not even miracles, but just when a bunch of people are getting converted, uh, that's what we would count as revival. If you're taking notes, um, I've, I've, I've titled my message Carefully Connected, Carefully connected. Uh, revival comes through this careful connection when heaven meets earth and then we just let whatever happened happen. It's, it's this careful connection that God seems to make. Um, have you ever encountered people who you didn't know why you needed them until you needed them? Um, have you ever met somebody who like you just felt drawn to them and you didn't know why? 
Um, like God is carefully connecting you to another human being as if like something about who you are and who they are is about to create something about where you both are. Um, those are the connections that I want to be just mindful of because those are spaces where we don't have to try to start something. We participate with what God has already started because you've been carefully connected. Um, when we talk about revival, I want you to jot this down. Revival is the presence of God's kingdom. Revival is the presence of God's kingdom. When we say the Lord is my shepherd, um, God being a shepherd is the idea of the kingdom of, of God. Um, revival is when God becomes shepherd, everyone is his sheep, he's really good, and everyone follows him. That is revival. Revival exists in this first sentence, the Lord is my shepherd. That's where I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get to a place where the Lord is my shepherd and not my emotions. The Lord is my shepherd and not my proclivities. The Lord is my shepherd, not my fears. The Lord is my shepherd, not my handicaps. The Lord is my shepherd, not my anxiety. That's what I'm trying to get at. Because anything that is your shepherd has become your king, and that's the kingdom that you're living in. And so revival begins when a group of people uh, come, 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 out of, um, come out of relationship with other things being their shepherd, and the Lord becomes my shepherd. I want you to imagine something for a moment. Um, I want you to imagine a world where God is king. Because the shepherd is king over the sheep. Now, I know you're thinking, shepherds can't be king, but Jesus comes as a shepherd, which, which means that there is an idea around shepherd and king that mixes together. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, imagine God as your Lord and as your shepherd. I imagine a shepherd who is exercising rule and reign and power and authority and dominion over your life. Imagine if God was ruling over creation without the hindrance of sin, without the hindrance of death, and all of the effects of it. Imagine if Genesis chapter 3 never happened. That's the part with the snake. Imagine if we just lived in a Genesis 1-2 reality. Um, will you guys trust me for a moment? All right, so I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine you. Imagine you apart from sin. Imagine if the sins you wrestled with, you didn't wrestle with anymore. Imagine if the things that wrestled with you were gone. The pain, the suffering. I I imagine the sin of your history no longer being a part of the fabric of your narrative. Meaning that sin of other people who have affected you. Imagine if that wasn't there. Imagine if the sins of your life that cause you to be where you are, imagine if that wasn't there. I imagine who you are without the hindrance of sin and pain and death and the fear of it. Who are you? Imagine if God's goodness and God's rule was the only thing that was influencing you. Imagine that for your household. I I imagine if God was, was exercising absolute perfect rule over your house and everything worked. The refrigerator works. Your kids work, your marriage works. Everything works because God is exercising absolute rule over you work. You can sleep at night. There's peace. He has, he has control over your finances, your bank account. Imagine God having exercised absolute rule over your neighborhood. So now it's not just you. It's not just your household. It's, now it's your neighborhood. Everything works the way that God designed it to work. No sin, no death. No fear, no anxiety. What does it look like? Imagine that over your community. Imagine that over your state. Imagine the state of Illinois, where everyone is submitted to the rule and reign of God and everything works. There's justice, there's righteousness, there's care, there's no greed. Somebody just fell out in the back. Jesus. Imagine that in our country. Imagine that in our world. You can open your eyes. If you can glimpse that even a little bit, um, you have just gotten a taste or a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not clouds that you float on with wings. The, the kingdom of heaven is your world transformed by the power and the rulership of God. That's the kingdom of heaven. When we say revival, we don't mean a moment. We mean a life. A life transformed by the power of, of God, not external to me, 
but my life transformed by the power of God. That's what we mean when we say revival. Now, this is going to happen in the end. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 tells us that there is coming a day where he will wipe every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death and no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old things have passed away and the new things have come. Revival is this idea beginning right now. It is the inbreaking of that world. Um, it is the thing that Jesus preached. It's the thing that Jesus demonstrated. It's the thing that Jesus taught us how to pray. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. When Jesus came, he started to preach, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. That reality that you just imagine, he says, hey, turn from whatever you're serving right now because that stuff is coming. Like, it's coming. Like, the change that you just imagined, like, some of you, I, could, I couldn't imagine it. My confession. It's hard. It's so hard for me to imagine my life apart from sin and the pain of sin and even the effects of the sin of others in my life. Like, like God's goodness is so ethereal to me sometimes because I could barely imagine who I would be apart from pain and apart from hurt and apart from harm. Like, who would I be if that thing that happened when I was six didn't happen? I would have made different decisions at 16 and I would have lived different at 26. Like, I, I, have, I can't even fathom who I would be. And so when Jesus says, repent, because God's rulership over your life is coming, like, I don't even have a construct to even imagine this. Because even my best imagination is still flawed. And so Jesus says, hey, you can't even imagine it, but here's what you can do. You could just turn, turn away. Um, and, and the first thing that Jesus tells us to repent from, funny enough, is not sin. The first thing that Jesus says, repent and believe the good news of the kingdom. Which means that if you primarily believe that God's goodness is far out in the distance when you die, Jesus says, I need you to repent from that and believe this good news. The kingdom of God is breaking and it's available right now. If you think that God's best is going to happen after you die, he says, mm, wrong, repent from that. I thought he said to repent from sin. It, uh, I need you to repent from that because if you still expect God's goodness to be over there, you're going to miss it when it's over here. He says, change your thinking. If you expect that God is going to be good to everybody but you, repent. If you think that God is going to be good when you finally get it all worked out, repent. If you think that God is going to be good once you become good, repent. Because the kingdom of God is here in Christ. So he says, that's the first thing I need you to change. Because the way that you believe it will happen is the way that you're going to live in this moment now. Most people refuse to reach out for God's goodness because they believe that God's goodness is going to come after they're good. And so they try to work on being good. And they can't be good. And so they refuse to grasp onto God's goodness. Most people refuse to be baptized because they think that they need to be good before they're baptized. But baptism comes to say that you can't be good, so God has been good and he's come to make you good over time. And so we get caught in this catch-22. He says, change your thinking. The kingdom of God is, is available right now. He demonstrated it in Luke chapter 4. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to, pro to proclaim this good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to those who are in prison, to recover the sight of the blind, the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus would say, listen, guys, I'm going to cast out this demon out of this person. Not to impress you, and not because I'm mad that somebody is demonically possessed or oppressed. He says, I'm going to drive out this demon. And if I do, then you must repent. Because he says, if I drive out this demon by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God is at hand. Look at that in Matthew, uh, in Matthew chapter 12. He says, if by the spirit of God I drive out this demon, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So if the demon goes, then you need to change what you believe. Do you guys get it? And so the history would say he drives out demons, he sets captives free, he heals the sick. That doesn't mean that we should say, Jesus is coming, oh, my sickness is going to be gone. It's, it's proof and evidence, it's signs to tell you what time it is. So he says, I don't want you to believe that God's goodness is afar in the future, can't reach it. And I don't want you to believe that you've got to die and maybe re resurrect in some new life and maybe then you'll get it. Because those are people with no hope on this side of eternity. But Jesus has come, and he's made that stuff available now. And he says, repent and believe that good news. And when that happens, that's the emergence of that is what we call revival. So as a church, how do we participate with this idea of revival? 
How do, we part, how do you participate with that good news? It's, it's, a, it's a great message, right? It sounds theologically great and all that, but how do I engage with that for real? Um, at the chapel, we've said this. We've said that we want to help others come alive to God, right? We, we want to come alive to God, and we want to help others do the same. So, like, we pray things like this in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is stuff that Jesus taught us to pray. Right, so we start to pray, Lord, like whatever it is you're going to do over there, you said that we could start to ask for that stuff to happen over here. And when stuff that belongs over there starts to happen over here, then we're entering into revival. So as a church, we, we want to come alive to God. We want to experience that. And we want to help others to experience that as well. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is, the, this is one of the hallmarks of how I have come to understand the gospel, have come to understand what it means to lead a church. Um, we want to help people to come alive to God, but we want to come alive also. He says, all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's how you engage with the message of, of, of the Bible. He first reconciles you to himself. That's step one. And then he invites you into this ministry of reconciliation. And God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And then he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. And so that's all I want to talk about today, is how do we engage with this ministry of reconciliation? Reconciliation means that all of heaven is being reconciled to all of earth. You guys see me doing two separate movements. I'm doing up and down and then over here and over there. Um, okay, I'm going to move heaven for a moment, and then I'm going to put it back, Okay. So heaven is up here, right? Uh, when Jesus talks about heaven, he talks about up. Um, he, he went up in the, uh, in the ascension. Um, in, in Jewish mindset, we talk about heaven as up. Um, but, it, but because we're Westerners and we write from left to right and we view time in this direction, if I ask you to draw a timeline, you would start here and you would draw it here. Not every culture thinks of time as linear. Many cultures think of time as circular, which makes a lot more sense because circular is like a cycle in a system, right? And everything, like time goes in a cycle. Everything moves in cycles and systems and seasons, right? So it makes more sense to think about time like a clock. But as Westerners, because we write and read this way, we think about time this way as well. So one of the best ways to understand the kingdom of God is to move heaven from top to the right. Because heaven is actually future, when Jesus would think of future, he would think of future as this up place. So God comes down, and when he goes back, he goes up, right? And that's the proper way that Jesus and his contemporaries thought of it. But as Westerners, if you want to get a fine idea of what heaven means, um, you're not going up in a Western mindset. You're going to the right, which means that when heaven comes, it's coming from the right to the left, which means that your future forgiveness has come to the left into now. Like, He's taking future stuff and bringing them into right now time. So when we say heaven coming down, you could also think heaven is coming from the right. Okay. It's just the way that our minds work, right? I mean, the way that you have to contextualize the gospel because then it's like, like stuff is coming from up there to down here. But stuff does come from up there to down here. The sun comes that way. Rain comes that, comes that way. I think that's the correct way. But we as Westerners, we have somehow moved heaven to the right. This is going great, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so, there, so these are the two ideas I want to, like, appeal this through, okay? Um, God has called us to be reconciled to him, and then he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Um, and these are the two words that I've been walking through with our staff team and our leader team. Uh, what I'm sharing with you today has been months in the making with our team as, as we've been exegeting our community and saying, how does revival work in this community with these people? Um, what's already in place here that makes the most sense? You guys saw how I had to, to talk about heaven as over here and over there, and I didn't talk about it from here to here. If I were talking to Easterners, I would do here to here only. But because I'm a Westerner and I'm talking to Westerners, I contextualize it and I say left to right and, and I move this way because it gives you a visual of future coming into present. In the same way, how does revival translate to you? You group people um, who live in the Midwest, who you are in Lake Zurich, you're at the chapel, you're here. How, how does it look here? Um, I have observed and realized that as a whole, most of us value 
these two things here, which is, it, it's pretty unique. I, I know it may seem like, duh, this makes sense, but this is really unique to you guys. So as our team got together and we said, if, if we're going to communicate the gospel in this community and we're going to help people to help others come alive, what are the vehicles that we're going to do that with? And I said, well, you guys really value connection. You guys really value like these like social pieces, like not even church stuff. I mean, like your friends who are not church people, they value connection. Like they have connection events. Like they just, they, they love the spaces of just like meeting with other people and just connecting and getting to know them or being connected. Like that's just a thing that seems to exist as a theme in our culture. Um, and care, my gosh, um, people here, they care so much that it makes me sick. I mean, y'all care about stuff that I'm like, I can't believe y'all care about that. Um, and you all care for each other in a way that is, that's, it's just phenomenal. You all care. Um, uh, we opened up a food pantry and we had to tell people, hey, 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 slow down. Too much stuff. Hold on. Like, if you all get to help with something, y'all show up. If we tell the community, this is not a Christian thing. This is something that's just here in this community. If, if there's a community cleanup that happens in Lake Zurich, a lot of people are coming. When Lake Zurich shows up, they show up. When it's time to do something, this community shows up because they care. They care. And it's not a Christian thing. It's just natural vehicle. If you were going to talk to your friends about Jesus, it's really important that you understand that um, if you send them a, a pamphlet, it is not going to do anything for them because they care about connection and do you care about them. That's not true everywhere, but it's very true in this culture, I think, more than others. And, and so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is the place where I want us to be able to understand that first, we must connect to God. Um, we must connect to God if we're going to in, engage in God was reconciling me to him so that I can reconcile the world to him. The, the Lord is my shepherd. And then Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. The beginning of revival is you connecting to God. You connecting to God. Not visiting with God on a Sunday, not checking him out every now and again. Um, revival begins with you connecting with God. I'm going to give us some new questions. And one of the reasons why I want to give us some new questions is because new questions help us to think differently, um, and they help us to shape a revival and, and, and move out of routine, right? Um, for instance, uh, I lead the young adults um, also on Tuesday nights, and we have um, a team of volunteers who've been serving in young adults for seven years. And every Tuesday night when we get together, they're asking the same questions, right? Um, and so I started interjecting some new questions and some, some, some new, new questions is helping them to think differently. And so this past week, the question was, what do these young adults need that only God has? That's all I want you to think about tonight. As you're talking, as you're listening, what do they need? And it changed how we prayed. It changed our conversation because we were engaging in a different way. We're, we're not asking, is everybody having a good time? We're not asking how many people come. We're, we're thinking, what do they need that only God can give them? And it changed the way that we engaged. In John chapter 9, um, Jesus' disciples are walking by this man who was blind, and they ask him, who sinned that this man was born blind, him or his parents? And Jesus says, shh, 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 bad question. Let's ask a new question. That's not the right question to ask. Um, in, in, in the gospel of Mark in chapter 3, um, they ask Jesus, is it right to work on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, how about we ask a new question? Is it right to do good on the Sabbath? And it changed the way that they engage with the world with new questions. Here's a question I, I want to ask you. Um, in this season of your life, how do you best connect with God? Not how's your relationship with God, not do you believe in God, not how do you connect with God on a regular basis. In this season of your life, if revival begins with you being reconciled to God so that you can join him in the ministry of reconciliation, the first portion of this must be true. How are you connecting to God in this season? Um, when you were 16, you connected with him one way. When you were single, you connected with him one way. When you were married, it got different. And if you're single again, it's probably different again. If you have children, it's different then. How do you connect with God in this season? This is a good question to even ask each other. Um, if you're married, ask your spouse, how are you connecting with God in this season of your life? How, how, how are you doing with this? Um, and, and, and you connecting with, with God, it could be, I listen to worship music. Um, listening to worship music to connect with God 
doesn't really work for me anymore for some reason. Like, so I listen to worship music, and I, I don't get that. Like, I used to be able to, like, lay in my living room and, oh, Jesus, I love you. But then my kids got older, <laughs> so I can't do that anymore. Okay, you guys know what I'm talking about. And so now it's like, well, how do you connect with God? And so then I used to go on a run. I used to live in South Florida. I used to go on a run for hours. Like, I mean, I, I would run like 15 miles. I would just be gone, like connecting with God. And then I moved here. I can't be running out here. It's too cold. Right? So, so, so in different seasons, my connection with, with God has changed. Now, if I say laying on the floor and listening to worship music is how I connect with God, and my kids got older, so I can't anymore, so let his will be done. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You must engage with how do you connect with God in the season. And if you don't know how, especially if you're in a small group, if you're around other Christians, ask this question. Um, we asked this in our staff and leaders meeting, um, and people got some new ways. It's like, oh, like I, I go on walks. Um, like I, I connect with God in the shower, so I'm showering three times a day. <laughs> right? Like, like how are you? And try out something new. Guys, if your connection with God is stale and dull and boring, baby, try something new. Don't just sit there and be like, I'm, I'm waiting for it to come back. Move forward, right? Uh, try out some, some, some new ways of connecting with God. And the second question I want to ask is, um, how is God connecting with you in this season? How, how, how is God connecting with you? Um, God connecting with you is a much deeper question because oftentimes we miss the way that God is connecting with us because of how, like, we are interested in God answering our prayers, how we ask them. And oftentimes God is engaging in ways with us that we didn't even ask for. Um, how, how, in this stage of life, again, this is about a stage of life, not forever. In this stage of life, how is God connecting with you? If he's connecting with you when you go to the grocery store, and, you, and you're talking to the cashier, and all of a sudden God is flooding your thoughts with, with, with like information. for the, you, you better go shopping three times a week. Because if he's connecting with you as you talk to people who don't know him, that's where you need to meet him. If God is connecting with you as you listen to other people, like you better show up in places where you can hear them. If God is connecting with you on drives, that was me for a season. Like, I'll be driving... And, I, like, I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing anything. I was just looking for cops. And I'm driving because I don't want to get tickets. So I'm just driving. And all of a sudden, like, I just, like, I would just start weeping in my car, like, God's presence. Like, I was like, oh, this is where he's leading me. I'll be back. And I'll go on drives. How is God connecting with you and lean into how God is connecting with you? Um, this is the stage where you have to find out where God is meeting you. Um, I have on my phone, um, it shows me like on this day last year, do you guys get those things, like the reminders? When those come up, oftentimes like I don't know what happens, but like I'm taken to this new place where God is like showing me like how he's been faithful to me over time and all of that. So I spend time in my photo album because God is meeting me there. Like connection with God is the beginning of, of revival. If coming to church on a Sunday and singing songs for 20 minutes is the only connection you have with God, there's more. How are you connecting with him? Lean into it. How is he connecting with you? And give yourself over to it more and more. And it's in regular things. It's really important that it's in regular things. Like, if if God connects with you, like, when you're playing with your kids, like, go serve in kids' church and give him space to do that more. Right? Like, like, however God is showing up to you, like, you owe it to yourself to engage with it because, here's why this is important, guys. Um, if you only connect with God in this kind of an environment, if this is your only connection with God, you'll never be able to do the ministry of reconciliation outside of this place. If you find him in normal things, you'll be able to find him with, with others and do the ministry of reconciliation in normal things also. Um, if you find him on your runs, if you find him uh, looking at your phone, if you find him on your drive, if you're leaning into those spaces, when he shows up, like when you're walking down the street with a stranger, like you are, you're accustomed to finding him outside of church and outside of church services and church events. And so you could participate with that. My point is, the, the way that you experience him is the way that you can lead others into experiencing him. And so I want to make sure that you have a pathway to experience God outside of this, right? Um, and, and, and when you connect with, with God, um, here, here's what's happening. Um, this is the hard part. Allowing God to meet your needs and desires. Um, connect with God in such a way that he can care for you. 
right? Um, I asked the question, like, like, how is God caring for you? Um, how is God meeting your needs and, and desires? This is what the psalmist means when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, thus I shall not want. Um, when, when God meets you and cares for your needs, um, he fulfills your desires in such a way that it silences your wants. Um, if you wrestle with sin, uh, wrestling with sin is a game that you're not going to win. You don't, like, you don't wrestle with sin and win. Um, the Lord becomes your shepherd he fulfills your desires and your needs, and it silences your wants. When he's your main course, he ruins your appetite f- f- for lesser things. And so, so he needs to be your shepherd. So then I find time with him. I lean into it. I clear my schedule. I continue to go back to this place. He becomes my shepherd, and I no longer want because I have the greatest thing ever in the universe. So how is he fulfilling my needs, and how is he fulfilling my desires? Um, How is God fulfilling your needs and your desires? Are you making room for him to do that? Um, Is there confession in your life? Like confession of sin. Uh, it was fascinating. I invited our staff and leaders into um, incorporating confession into their, into their own prayer time. And we started to meet together. And I started to ask, how is that going? Because spending time with God and listening and crying and feeling good, that's one thing. But it's another when in that time I enjoy him, but I make room for confession of sin. God, he, like, I know you saw me, but I need to tell you, here's what I did. Here's, here's what I thought. Here's where I'm out of line. Confession of sin. Also, conf- confession of harm, how, how you're experiencing sin of others. Lord, like, this person said this thing to me, and I'm hurt. Like, confession. God, this, this person said nothing to me, and I feel dismissed. Confession. Confession of sin, confession of harm, and confession of goodness. But you are good, and you're faithful. You've shown up in ways that nobody else can. I confess what I have done, I confess what they have done, and I confess who you are. Incorporating confession into your time with God. I'm answering the question of how do you connect with God? God is reconciling you to himself first. This is reconciliation, where there's forgiveness, where there's healing, and where there's fulfillment. That's you being reconciled to God. Are you guys with me? So you're leaning into the way that you're connecting with God. You're leaning into the ways that God is connecting with you. You're confessing your sin, you're confessing harm, you're confessing goodness, and there's healing, there's restoration, there's forgiveness. This is the reconciliation of relationship with God. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, 19 says that my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches and his glory. He's not going to give me everything I want, but he will, he will satisfy my every need. I said something really offensive once, and they told me to not say it anymore, and here's what it is. I said... <laughs> I said that um, there's not a desire that any human can have that God cannot fulfill. Like every desire, even the horrible ones, have come from God, and thus God can fulfill them. And, it, and people got mad because I said they come from God. And they're like, no, 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 like what about like the murderers? What about the killers? Like they have a desire. Like does that come from God? And people who abuse others, do those desires come from God? I'm like, yes. Those desires come from God. They, they have been contorted. They have been misaligned. They have been out of place. And the fulfillment for those desires have found their roots in evil. But the desire is pure. If your desire has come from the devil, then only the devil can fulfill it. But your desires have come from God. And what God has come to do is give us righteous fulfillment for these desires. Right fulfillment for the for, for desire. So I no longer pray for, for my desires to go away. Or for my needs to go away. God, would you fulfill my desires and fulfill my needs because they are from you. The enemy has given me five other pathways to fulfillment, but you are the only one I want. I'm trying to see if I'm helping anybody, but it's good. All right, so, so we want to cultivate these practices, right? This is our connection with God. I'm sorry if this doesn't feel like a sermon, right? Uh, but I really just want to do like discipleship, if I could, around your connection with God. If we're going to see revival, I don't want to tell you to go out and tell people that Jesus is king and Jesus is Lord and that they should, fo- and that they should follow him. Because if you do that and you have no connection with God, you risk being a hypocrite. Um, you risk inviting people to have bread that you've never tasted. All right. Verse, verse 2 and 3, he makes me lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. This is God just caring for you. Like letting God lead you. Listen, um, when he tells you to lie down, lay your butt down. Just lay down. Um, when he tells you to rest, it's a good idea to just rest. He leads me down green, green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Like, that's your connection with God where he's leading you and guiding you. My sheep know my voice. When I hear him, I trust him. I follow him. I'm giving myself over to him. He's my sheep, and he, he's my shepherd. I'm his sheep, and he's my king. Um, this is how the kingdom comes in my connection with God. And God cares for me. Um, God cares f- for me in my resistance, um, when life gives me r- resistance, and when there are obstacles in my life. How is God caring for you when there is resistance and obstacles? When, you, when life gives you resistance, when things happen, when you get a diagnosis, when, 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 when your bank account doesn't, when, when you lose your job, like when your kids start to, like when those things start to happen, um, how, how is God caring for you in those spaces? Not how you power through. How is he caring for you? When you connect with him and you find time with him and you confess your sin, you confess your harm, you confess his goodness, how is he caring for you? Well, he didn't change everything, but I do have a greater sense of joy inside of me, like he cares for me. He didn't work out everything, but I do feel his nearness, like he's caring for me. Um, He doesn't prevent me from walking through valleys, but even though I walk through the valley in the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, not because I'm brave, but because he is with me. How is he caring for you as you go through opposition and obstacles in life? Not how you power through, but how he cares for you. And, 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 And this one was something that was hard to convey, but how does he care for you in radical obedience? And here's what I mean by this. Um, How does he care for you when you do the really hard thing to say yes to him um, and you go against yourself? Um, I started telling our staff and leaders, um, like, we have to start going against ourselves in order to pursue the kingdom. And going against myself means this. I don't want to. And it's going to hurt me to. But I'm choosing him over this. I'm going against me. When you go against yourself, especially when you hear the voice of God and he's calling you and leading you, um, sometimes it hurts. It hurts. I I, I told my kids this the other day. It was like, like, um, like if apologizing feels like it's going to kill you, it says, yes, it feels like it's going to kill me. Like, I just can't say sorry. I'm like, hey, let it kill you. Let it kill that part of you that needs to die. And so, like, I'm going to go against, because me, I don't like saying sorry because you should know I'm sorry. I know, it's weird. That's how I was raised. I, I never heard those words in my house. I knew my mom was sorry, but she never said it. I, I knew my sister was sorry, but nobody ever said it. And so now in my house, this, this young lady over here is teaching my kids that they should say, I'm sorry. And I'm like, oh, it's not a thing that I'm used to. And so like, I, I go against me because I'm leaning into something else as God is leading me. And he cares for me when there is like this radical obedience in my life. When, when there's radical obedience, let me show you what I mean here. Um, when uh, uh, 1 Peter 5, 6, it says this, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, humble yourself under God's mighty hand, and then he will lift you up in due time, casting your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That verse, oh, it's so good. That, that verse is not about you having a bad day. That verse is about you choosing humility and having the pain of forgiving somebody who does not deserve it, and it hurts you. And then God comes and lifts you up in due time because he cares for you. It's not that he cares for you because you're sick. That's that's true. He cares for you when the pain of serving him is real. If you've never had pain in serving God, you're, you're missing out on the good stuff. If, 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 you, if you have never had to bite your tongue until it bleeds because you want to say something out of pocket, you have missed it. If, 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 you, if you have never looked somebody in the face and forgive them knowing good well that you don't want to but that you should because of him and it hurts you. If, like how many of you, like when you're mad, tears start coming down your face? And it's not that you're sad. It's because you're mad because you're fighting to hold your Jesus. The pain. Like when your boss says something slick. And you just want to, 
Okay, all right. But it's, it's the pain, it's the self-control. Um, if you have self-control in your life, it hurts. Ah. And, they, and then God cares for me in the midst of it. I humble myself under his mighty hand. And then in due time, he lifts me up because he cares for me. That's the kind of care I'm talking about. See, that's the kind of revival that God is bringing. The kind of revival where I experience him when, when I face obstacles, when I face pain, but also even when I say yes to him. If he spared not his own son, if Jesus is the incarnation of God and the human who we're called to be, and his yes to God resulted in a cross, believe for no second that your yes to God will not require the Holy Spirit to come and raise you from the dead. There are some things that saying yes to him will kill you for. There's some things where he'll tell you to stay and, and you want to go. There's some times where he'll tell you to do something opposite of you. But he says, if any man wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you try to save your life, then you're going to lose it. But if you just lose your life for his name's sake, that's when you find it. That's what revival is. That's revival. It's not when I keep you accountable. It's when I keep me accountable. It's not when I tell you truth. It's when I tell myself truth, even when I don't want to do it. Ugh. All right, let's get to the end of this. Uh, this, is, this is too much already. This is too much already. All right. Um, and, and, and so, so, all right, so look at verse, uh, let's go to verse 4. It says, so you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Um, and this is where now it flows into, into the out. Uh, my cup runs over. Um, these are the kinds of questions that we ask when God has reconciled me to himself. Um, when I start to experience God in, in, in how he's pursuing me, when I start to experience God in my valleys, when I experience God in pain, in the pain of life and in the pain of obedience, when he restores me and leads me and guides me and fills me, and I'm on that. And it's not just a moment where that is my cycle with him. When I'm exper- That's what it means to experience revival, by the way. Experiencing revival it doesn't mean that you're always being healed. Because if, if you're that sick, I don't know what's wrong with you. All right, so experiencing revival is not like I'm getting healed every day. Experiencing revival means that God is connecting with me and caring for me as I incur the harms of life. Right? That's revival, which means that it's not stewing in you and growing in you and becoming a bitter root in you, that God can uproot it and heal you and you keep walking with, with him and you've been reconciled to him and then your cup overflows. He anoints my head with oil. He leads me, he guides me, valleys, high, low. He pours oil on my head. My cup starts to overflow. And when my cup overflows, that is the ministry of reconciliation. That's what flows into community. Some people are trying to call God to rain down in community. I'm like, no, God wants to overflow into community. God does not want to rain down on your neighbors. He wants to fill your house and overflow into your neighborhood. That's revival. And so your connection with God is the beginning. So here's the, here's the question I want to ask. Um, uh, who or what has God entrusted to me? Right? Uh, who or what has God entrusted to me? And who and what am I connected to? These are careful connections. These are the people who are already in your life, the places where you already go. Uh, overflow is not about you trying to send something somewhere. Overflow simply means I show up and stuff is just overflowing and it's touching whatever is around me. Who and what has God entrusted to me? Uh, if, you, if you go to school, um, you're not just there as a recipient. If you show up, if you show up in any place and you shake up a bottle of soda and you open it and it spills, wherever you put the bottle is where it's going to spill. If God has put you in school, that's where it's going to spill. If he's put you with these kids, that's where it's going to spill. If he's put you on a sports team, that's where it's going to spill. Um, your cup runs over wherever God, whatever you're connected to. And whatever he's entrusted to you. If you have kids, he's entrusted kids to you. If you have neighbors, he's entrusted neighbors to you. If, if you have co-workers, those are the kinds of questions that I want to be asking. Um, what has God entrusted to me? Um, and the last verse in there says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, this, is, this is the question um, that... Goodness starts to follow me. Um, not the kind of goodness that's lip service. Um, in, in pastoral care, sometimes um, 
I, I often tell, tell people sometimes, I'm not the best person for pastoral care. Um, I'm not the best person for pastoral care because if you sit with me for pastoral care, oftentimes I can only minister out of the journey I've been on and I've been through valleys and I've been through hardship. And so I, I'm probably not going to give you a cotton candy kind of gospel. Like, I'm probably going to say really, really hard things. Um, good, good, goodness and mercy will follow, uh, but the goodness and mercy that I have experienced is the goodness and mercy I found in the valley and that I found in darkness and that I found in low places. And it's the kind of goodness and mercy that has come at the hands of sacrifice and hardship. And, and so a lot of people want something without nothing, and I can't offer it. Because his goodness, his, his goodness has shown up in some really hard places. Um, and so, so when I sit, I, I, I ask the, the question um, not about what anybody else can do, but what I can do. Um, this, this is the question I ask. Uh, how can I use the resources of my world for the benefit of others? Your journey, your stuff. Um, how can I use the resources of my world for the benefit of others? The stuff that God has given you uniquely. The stuff that you could do uniquely. The journey that you have been on. Um, if you have overcome some sickness in your body, you have a resource that most people don't have. If you have had a failed marriage and it hasn't worked and you have come through it and you've turned around and you're able to, to forgive with radical forgiveness, you've got something that maybe somebody else needs. How can you use the resources of your world? So maybe it's not time for you to coach a soccer team because those aren't the primary resources that God has given you. How can you use the resources of your world to overflow what God, if you've been through some valleys, you've got a resource that nobody else has because there's stuff that you can only find in the valley. If you've been on the mountaintop and you've had to choose God on the mountaintop, now I'm looking at some of your faces. Some of you have had to make really hard decisions, not because things were hard, but because things were really good. Who are you when you're successful is a really hard question to answer. Because I find that the more power and the more riches people get, uh, cor corruption is knocking at your door. And so people who chose to follow him a, on a mountaintop, you have a resource that others need. You've met him in some hard places. And you've experienced revival on a mountaintop. You've experienced revival in a valley. And when you come out, you've got some resources. How can you use the resources of your world? Uh, you care about stuff that other people don't care about, and it's really important that you care about it. Uh, some of you in this room care about things, please, please hear me, that other people don't care about. Don't let people rob your passion so that they can give you theirs. Please don't let people rob your passion so that they can give you theirs. Because what you're passionate about is how you're carefully connected because God wants to overflow in that place. If you trade your passion for mine, I have robbed an area where God wants to be king over all creation. Some of us are uniquely passionate about something, uniquely connected to some things. Don't just come to church and try to do this in church. What's unique about the chapel in Lake Zurich is that as the leader here, I'm not trying to get a bigger church. Pastor Scott said a few weeks ago, we already have a big church. We have nine campuses. We have a big church. Checkbox. Okay, now what? Uh, we come from South Florida. I pastored a mega church. I'm not trying to grow us here. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we not can grow in this building, but how can you grow God's influences to what you're connected to? That's what I need to figure out. If people come, that's, that's great. But that's not what we're looking for. I don't celebrate big church. I celebrate big moves in places where you're connected to. When, when, when people come and they say, man, like, like, like God has opened up this door. Uh, uh, we have some ladies here. Uh, they go to the Lifetime Fitness, and they're doing Bible studies down there. And people are coming to Christ down there. And, and I'm like, y'all better not just be showing up to church. You better go and serve those, those people because God is, re revival is happening down there. Like, what are you connected to? If you go to the gym, overflow in that gym. All right, put, can you put up that last slide and then I'll, I'll be out of your way. This is a busy slide. Put up the one with the boxes and, and this is all I have. Yeah, skip that one. Okay. All right, no, 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 I had some time. I had some time. I, I had some time last night. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, so this is not for everybody. I know, don't take pictures yet. I can send this via, via email. I thought to myself, this is, um, <laughs> this is the Eisenhower Matrix. Um, I thought to myself, um, if I were in your seat... Uh, what would help me go forward? And I thought to myself, well, everybody's in a different seat. So here's how this works, okay? I'm going to tell you how it works, and then you can figure it out. 
You guys are good? All right, here, here we go. All right. Okay, so, so, so maybe you're in a place where you don't care about a whole lot of stuff and you're not connected to, to a whole lot of stuff. Apathy. Not connected, don't care about anything. Like, I, I'm, like, um, depression probably sits on the throne of your life. And it's really hard to care and to have empathy about anything because you're not connected to things that you care about and you don't really feel like you, you care about much. Uh, here are some questions I would, I would ask. Uh, if you don't feel cared for by God or connected to God, I would start asking questions. How else can I connect with God? Maybe your old routine is not working and you need a new one. Maybe standing up in worship is, is the beginning. Next time, try to lift your hands and just see what happens. Next time, try to kneel. Just take up a different posture. Uh, how, how is God connecting with me? Right? You start to pay attention to moments where you feel more of God's presence than others and not just wait for a church service. Um, oh, this one's good. Am I holding back from deeper connection? Like, I don't care about anything. Well, what have you done? Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> problem number one. Um, like, have you taken any invitation that people have given you? No. People invite me to serve. They invite me to group. They invite me to pray. And I say no. I don't know why my relationship with God is not growing. Am I holding back from deeper connection? Or maybe it's with others, right? Um, who has God entrusted to you? Maybe you don't care about a bunch of stuff now, but the question is, who are you connected to? Who, has, who, who, who do you uniquely, and what do you uniquely care about? So, some of you uniquely care about politics in a way that oh, just makes me sick. But, but some of you care about it in ways that makes the most sense. Don't, don't let go of your passion to hold on to mine. If you uniquely care about politics, that's where you need to start. You need to start to ask some of these questions. Um, all right, who could benefit most from what God is doing in my life? What if I started praying about that thing? What if I started to help local politicians in just hanging signs, if that's what I'm passionate about? What if I'm not just an internet warrior? See, you guys are good. But Jeremiah says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If, if you sit and don't seek, you will not find. And so these are questions, right? We said new questions keep us moving, right? Jesus asked new questions to keep us moving. Okay, so maybe you have stuff that you care about, but you're not connected to it, right? I really care about this. Or maybe you feel like you're really connected to God, but you don't feel cared for by God. Like, I feel connected to God. Like, I, I, I know that he's here. I know he likes me. I know he, he loves me. But I don't feel cared for by God. New expressions of worship. Oh, um, uh, how can I deepen my gratitude towards God? I've been telling you guys about a gratitude journal. Um, if you feel connected to God, you've been a Christian for a long time, but you just don't feel like God cares for you in ways that matter, um, start a gratitude journal and just start to list the things that, that you're grateful for. Once you get past the surface stuff, you'll start to see how much he cares for you. Right? You, you, you start to increase your gratitude. Or maybe you care about others in, in a way that you're not connected to. And this is where you start asking about your resources. Down here. Maybe you have high connection, but low care. I'm connected to some people who I don't like. Amen. <laughs> right? Or, or um, I, I, feel, I, feel really con I, I feel really connected, but not cared, cared for in my relationships. These are just questions to help us move in a different direction, right? Um, like, for instance, if you're connected to things that you don't care about much, um, how should this con connection reshape my prayer life, right? Like, how can I just start to care about the things I'm connected to and connect to things I care about? So that's, that's the revival I want to talk about. How do you connect to things that you care about? And how do you care about things that you're connected to? If you care about social justice, even if you don't have a job in it, how can you use your voice and your resources to serve in that space? If you care about the marginalized and the poor, and you are connected to God, what if you sh showed up and got shook up and unloosed the top and just see what happens? What if revival happens when you show up and just care? What are you connected to? And how can you care? And what do you have this high degree of care about? that you haven't really connected to in a real way. Revival is not a meeting. It's not a gathering. It's a people who are connected to God and cared for by God. And the outflow of that is we start to connect the things we care about and we care about the things we're connected to. And you will see the life of God flow like never before.